Good morning and welcome to worship. I am delighted that you're here. Whether you're joining us here in the sanctuary or you're watching on our YouTube channel, it is a delight to be together worshiping God on this second Sunday of Advent. We're counting up quickly towards the Nativity of Jesus. There are friendship cards here. If you have never filled one of these out, if you're visiting for the first time, or even if you've had a, maybe a change to your email or other addresses, you may fill this out and give it to an usher as we're leaving, and the ushers will also be collecting the offering plate, uh, your offering and things like that. Maybe you haven't turned in a pledge card or a time and talent sheet for 2023 and would like to do that. The ushers have blank ones, and they would be glad to help you fill one out. I hope you'll go out this door as we leave worship today and join us in the courtyard for a holy time. Holy being donut holes. We have Dunkin' Munchkins and coffee and I think water, maybe some juice bags for the kids. But that's a wonderful time for us to know each other and fellowship together. So after worship, we'll go out that way. I apologize that the elevator's not working. We'll, work, we'll get to that tomorrow. But somebody who is a professional has to fix that. And they, we will get to that and hopefully be working next Sunday. Next, is a, next Sunday is a special one. It's our Music Sunday. And I'm so looking forward to that, to hear all of our bells and contemporary singer and everyone who will be uh, doing something special for worship next Sunday. Today's the last day for the giving tree. I hope you brought gifts for that. If you suddenly realize there's a problem, you can come back first thing in the morning with your giving tree gifts. And next, uh, not next Sunday, but the 18th is a Christmas luncheon for the congregation. I'm looking forward to that and hope you'll join us. Todd, you're going to make an announcement, as I recall, as he's coming forward. I hope I haven't forgotten anything. It's delightful to have you in worship. When we worship at our Lord's table, we'll come down the center aisle, and everyone is welcome and invited at our Lord's table. Morning. Um, the Way Forward Committee is continuing its work. I just want to remind everybody who else is on this committee. Um, Cindy McKay, David Albright, Donnie Sloan, Margaret Baker, Mary Dingman, Stephanie Gladden, and also our, con our consultant continues to be Dan Holloway from Pinnacle. They and he have been incredible uh, help in what we're doing. Um, before I start, I want, I want to say something, and then I want you to repeat it. Okay, so we, we had a little bit of a of an email back and forth this week about what a particular meeting should be called in January. And Donnie came up with something, and I've got to tell you, at the beginning of it, I thought it was a little bit wordy. But it now, after going through some of this stuff, it makes complete sense. So I'm going to say it, and then I want you to say it, because hopefully you're going to be part of this in late January. So the meeting is going to be called, Help Us Find Our Way Forward. One, two, three. One more time. Help. Perfect. So, see, Donnie, it's perfect. You're creative, just like we all, just like we all knew. Okay. So, this past week we had a meeting. The Way Forward Committee had a meeting with with Walk and with Dan, and we basically reviewed what we had come up with in, earlier in October, which is basically 12 areas of focus, 12 important items that we see ourselves focusing on as we, no pun intended, go forward. So the next step in this is to get you guys involved again. You all have been part of this way forward from the beginning. We did the 40 days of prayer. We did the surveys. We did the listening sessions. So we're going to bring everybody together one more time. Notice I didn't say one last time. One more time in late January. And basically in this help us find our way forward input meeting, we're going to go over in the fellowship hall and we will break up into groups, four, five, six, and we're going to ask you what three or four of those 12 you find most important. Now, between now and then, we're going to email you or we'll have hard copies of those 12 items 
so we don't just spring those on you at the late at the last moment so from that from that help us find our way forward meeting we're going to start to be able to to really focus on what is important the other thing we're going to do at that meeting is called a clarification excuse me a values clarification exercise it's basically is basically going to talk about what are we really about what is important to our church almost it's like without this we wouldn't be a church so it's going to be a really important meeting it's going to be a i'm going to call it fun because anytime we're together and actively trying to make our church better so we can more actively and closely do what god wants god wants us to do here i find that to be a plus if you have any questions i'll be hanging around at the holy meeting um because I'll, I'll be wanting some, some donuts as well. So again, um, I'm Todd Carson. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them for you. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. I'm not sure I reintroduced our preacher today, continuing our series, Our Preachers of Excellence. Reverend Neeson, I'm so glad that you're here to bring the gospel to us. Let's worship God together. Peace. We are 
the followers of Jesus, that group of Jesse, of whom Isaiah spoke. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world, to all of creation, that peace, will, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, and bear fruits worthy of repentance. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 8. We light up these candles, the candle of joyful hope and the candle of proclaimed peace, and part to remind ourselves that we are a people risen towards God's promise. But we also light them as a sign to the world and an announcement that there are some who hold on to the hope and there are some who walk the way of peace. We stand as a sign that Emmanuel is still our firm prayer. Please pray with us, the Advent prayer in the world. Pray with me our prayer of confession of sin. Let's approach the throne of God's grace with confidence. O oh Lord, we have much to confess. We let the season overwhelm us, and we are caught up in a frenzy of coveting all that we see. We are tempted to buy more than we need or can afford. We look at neighbors' homes and think we see much more than we have. Help us to look with Advent eyes and see Christ around us and look Him this season. Hear our silent prayers, O Lord. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Dear friends, Christ was raised for us. He rules in power for us. In his name I declare, 
we are forgiven. Amen. Peace be with you, and please greet your neighbors. It may be with a peace sign or a fist bump or just a wave, but peace be with you. Peace. reading from the book of Psalms. This is a Psalm of Solomon. So I invite you to listen to the word of God as it comes to us from Psalm 72. It's in your pew Bibles if you'd like to look that up on page 656. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. May mountains yield prosperity for the people and hills in his righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. Now skipping a bit from Solomon's words. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Amen and amen.
So, we have lots of symbols in church today, and more folks are coming. So we can look around at symbols, and I see some new symbols for this season. Hi. And I, I see lots of things that are symbolic. So what symbols do you see here in our church? I see an angel. You see an angel. And other symbols? There are symbols on this table, aren't they? What do they remind us of? Jesus. Exactly. The bread and the juice of communion are symbols that remind us of our Lord Jesus. And I, I see other symbols. You may even want to stand up and look around. The cross is always here, but something's new. And on that tree are lots and lots of symbols. Can you pick out one or two of those? I, yes. A star. I see a star. What does that remind us of? Of when Jesus was born. The star of Bethlehem. What else might be up there? Anchor. An anchor. Do you know what that reminds us of? Uh -uh. It reminds us that Jesus is our anchor in the storm. And he keeps us safe and secure. I see a flower. I see a dove. I see a uh, lamb. A lamb. A lamb. There are lots of symbols here in the church. Let's take a field trip. Come with me. <laughs> An advent wreath. And look, the last time we were here, there was only Mary and Joseph and the angel and the donkeys in the stable. But look who's come. Angel. Well, perhaps. I guess the angel wasn't here last week. But look who else is here. The wise men. Those are shepherds. Those are our wonderful Scottish shepherds with a bagpipe and a horn. We Presbyterians keep it straight. You need to come up here and see the shepherd with the bagpipes. I am not making it up. Lots of symbols. And look who's missing from this manger scene. Baby Jesus. Yes, it's not his birthday yet. I mean the Messiah. And the wise men aren't here either. They are journeying from afar. So you'll have to come back next week and we'll see who has come to the manger to celebrate Jesus. Then we'll have to come back on Christmas Eve. And see if Jesus has come. Let's have a prayer. I'll say a line and you all say a line, okay? Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. We await his coming. We await his coming. In his name we pray. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may go to Sunday school. You may go back to your seats. To go to Sunday school. Okay, you may go to Sunday school.
pray with me. Good and gracious God, open us to your word in our lives. Open us to hear your voice in the many ways you speak. And I pray this morning that my reflections are faithful to your love and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. So the year is about 2829 B.C. Or excuse me, A.D., and the setting is the wilderness of Judea. Now that was a rough, desolate, uh, incredibly lonely area of sand, mountains, rocks, dry riverbeds. From that desolation emerged a strange looking man, strange acting man too, John he was called, John the Baptist. Matthew gives this, this is how Matthew tells the story of John the Baptist. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, John wore clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. What a character John must have been, right? Unkempt, muscular, strong but bony because his diet as you just heard had been bugs locusts and whatever he could scrape up his clothes were likely fur rags that probably smelled and were caked with dust and dirt he had a booming voice that echoed off the surrounding rock cliffs and he had a singular message he delivered it relentlessly repent now here, repent. And the people flocked to him from all around, Jerusalem, Judea, all along the river. Do you hear anything strange about that scenario? A seedy-looking preacher, a religious fanatic by today's standards, emerges from the desert yelling, repent, and people like it. Or at least they do it. They go to the water. I mean, isn't that odd? I mean, if you, if you suspend our, our um, usual tendency to whatever it says in the Bible can't be odd, suspend that for a minute. This is odd. Even stranger is the fact that every year, just before Christmas, usually the second Sunday of Advent, the church suggests that we read one of the passages from one of the Gospels about John the Baptist. In fact, when Walk asked me to preach today, he reminded me in his email, remember, it's John the Baptist Sunday. 
And remember, John the Baptist, at least in this scene, isn't before Jesus is born, it's well after, right? So it doesn't even fit time-wise in the story. So just before Christmas, every year at this time, we hear the word, repent. And we get told about Jesus' strange cousin John and his relentless message. And we get told um, that, that we're supposed to listen to this repent stuff. And if the truth be told, I mean, if we're honest here, and you don't even have to act happy when I say this, but most of us don't like that. Not right now, right? No, don't, I won't ask you. Or maybe better, we don't get the connection. It just doesn't seem to fit the Christmas season. I mean, the kids were talking about all the nice stuff they saw up there, stars and angels and uh, shepherds with bagpipes. It, it, it's really true. He's right. There's bagpipes here. Lent, maybe we're going to hear this message, but Christmas, Christmas season? It all leads to the question, what did those people who actually knew John see in him or see in his message, and why with everything else we're supposed to be about these days, do we get settled with a saddled with a word like repent? What does John the Baptist and repent have to do with getting ready for Christmas? Now, if you look up the word repentance in the dictionary, which I did to prepare for this, you're going to find a definition something like this. To feel sorry for what one has done or failed to do, to be conscience-stricken or contrite, to feel such regret or dissatisfaction over some past action, intention, etc., as to change. Most of us, when we hear the word repent or repentance, think it means something like that. It's connected to a feeling of guilt and sorrow for the past. And most of us, for most of us, this season, we already feel bad enough about things we aren't doing, places we aren't going, or someone we're disappointing, that we don't need to actually add repentance to our list of things to get done. Not right now. After Christmas, yeah, maybe, when the bills come in and the weight gain is obvious. And this is precisely, I think, where the people who so willingly heard and received John the Baptist's message knew something we don't know or don't remember. They knew that as far as God is concerned, repentance actually has very little to do with the past, with guilt, with feeling bad. Frederick Buechner, who's one of my favorite uh, theologians, in his book, A Seeker's ABC, defines repentance this way. He says, to repent is to come to your senses. It's not so much something you do as something that happens. True repentance spends less time looking at the past saying, I'm sorry, and more time looking to the future saying, wow. In other words, repentance is more, is, is more about what we do than about what we did. It's about how we see now. It's a shift in our orientation. It's about turning away from the wilderness of self-centeredness and self-preoccupation and turning toward God's goodness and God's grace. Re repentance is not so much about assuming guilt for the past it's about affirming grace in the present and hope for the future. When we repent, we do not so much, we do not close our eyes in sorrow and weeping. We open our eyes and look for God's presence. When John the Baptist spoke so passionately to those crowds, think of this, sometimes we forget. He was speaking to people who had been overwhelmed by the wilderness in their lives. He was speaking in the wilderness about the very re real wilderness of living. As the people had examined their own faith, they would have realized it had been hundreds of years since the prophets had spoken. As a people, they had known only oppression and poverty. At the time of John, they were under the pagan, overbearing rule of Rome. You can just hear them 
The scriptures tell us the Messiah will come, but how? Where? When? Surely God has forgotten us. We're tired. We're overwhelmed. Woe is us. And into that wilderness comes the wild one, John. And what does he say to that? Repent. What? Repent? Turn around, he says. Look, or you're going to miss what God is doing right now. Repentance was quite literally a way of life. It was a spiritual practice, if you will. And for those who repented, who turned around, who looked again, who opened their eyes, for them, they saw the grace of God. They recognized the Messiah. And for them, life was never the same. Repentance, they would say, is the best thing that ever happened to us because it helped us see what we could have missed. It was several years ago now, and I don't remember where I found this story, but it was a story about a, a, a man named Ralph. He was a former soldier. And I think it has particular poignancy to retell it as, as we have another Christmas season when uh, some of the world is at war. The teller of the story was a professor at a large American university. He'd been invited to speak at a military base. It was December. Ralph was the guy's name. He had been sent to um, meet him at the airport. So after they had introduced themselves, they headed toward the baggage claim. And all the way down the concourse, the professor remembered, he said, Ralph kept disappearing. Once he went over to help an older woman whose suitcase had fallen open. Once he went to lift a couple of toddlers to where they could see Santa Claus. And another time, he gave directions to someone who, who was lost. And every time he came back, he came back with a big smile on his face and picked up the conversation exactly where he had left off. The professor just couldn't figure out how he did it. And so he asked, how did you learn to do that? And Ralph looked at him and said, do what? He said, how did you learn to live like that? You just go off and help somebody and come right back? And oh, said Ralph, I think it was during the war. And over the course of the next hour or so, he told the professor about his tour of duty in Vietnam and how it was his job to clear the minefields and how he watched one of his friends and then another blow up before his eyes. He said, I learned to live between the steps because I never knew whether the next one would be my last. So I learned how to get everything I could out of the moment when I put one foot down, picked up my foot, and put the other down. Every step I took, he said, it was a whole new world. And I guess I'd just been that way ever since. Repentance is learning to live between the steps. It's a way of looking at the world in which nothing looks the same. When we repent, we begin to look. When repentance happens, we actually begin to see. Repent, cries the Baptist, and be amazed at what you see. Be touched by grace. So the feeling that goes with repentance then is not depression or sorrow or guilt, it's appreciation. When we have an experience of repentance, we will recognize it by our ability to appreciate something or, or someone or even ourselves in a new way. To the people who came to John the Baptist, he offered, if you can call it like a lens through which to see the world, he offered a new appreciation of that river and of their faith and of the promises of God. That's what the prophets of old had always done for the people. They had called and coerced and scared people into a new way of seeing. And the people of Israel, John's people, recognized a prophet when they heard one. I think we need to hear such prophecy as well. This is a season for hearing the call of John the Baptist again. It's a season for repentance, for appreciation. You know, think about it. There is so much, I don't need to tell you this, there's so much to see and do this season, right? And there's a lot we can miss if we're not careful. I mean, this is the season when we clean and we decorate and we sing and we help people and we're generous to a fault. 
It's a season when everything around us is like crying to get our attention and change the usual way things are done. Everything around us cries, look, look. It's the season when more than any other time of the year, we turn everything around, right? We turn our houses upside down. We move furniture to accommodate trees and people. We challenge the darkness with lights, way more lights than other times. We bombard the post office with mail. It's the only time of the year, and I think this is still more or less true, it was more true at one time, but we get more personal mail than advertisements. Only time of the year that happens, right? You, at least you hope, I mean, you hope you do it anyway. That's. All of it, I think, is a cry for repentance to turn ourselves around, to look again, to notice. The challenge is as simple as it is profound. Don't give up on Christmas, give in to it. Notice the beauty. Listen to the music, sing the carols, enjoy the lights, appreciate the gifts of the season. Remember, life is precious and God is here, even in the frenzied moments of shopping and crowds. That's what the Baptist said to the people. And that's, I think, what he, what he says to us. Don't miss the coming of the Lord. Repent. Look around. Look. Look that you might see. Learn to live between the steps, wherever those steps take you. I, I think the most dreaded words that most of us see this time of year, and I think this is especially true for parents of small children, but it's true, actually, for almost anything these days. It's the, it's the words that are found on a lot of packages that people will open on Christmas morning. Some assembly required. No matter how simple the promised directions are, it will never be as easy as they say it will, right? The directions in our box are by mistake in, in Japanese or they're in English, but it might as well be Japanese. Or they get thrown out with the wrapping paper. Or we have everything we need but that one little thingy that you, you, nobody in their right mind ever keeps. Some assembly required always requires more than assembly. It requires study and patience and a sense of humor. But if we work at it, most of the time, we can do it. Though we complain like crazy and feel like throwing the box out altogether, most of the time, right, with a little work, we succeed. And I want to suggest to you that that's the way it can be with this season, with Christmas. With the Christmas season, as with so many gifts, some assembly is required. We may not like it, but complaining about it won't get us where we want to be. Complaining about the materialism, the endless parties, the practices, the concerts, the pageants, crowded airports, it's not going to get us anywhere. Avoiding all of the above won't do it either, but repentance will. Repentance is the assembly required to make Christmas joy possible. So, so if you find yourself this season pushed and pulled in too many directions, if you're so tired you can't wait for January, repent. Open your eyes. There's something for you to learn. If you find Christmas a depressing time, lonely, unhappy, filled with difficult memories, repent. Open your eyes. There's something for you to learn. If you find yourself a bit cynical toward all the commercialism, a bit mistrustful of all the good cheer, Repent. Open your eyes. There's something for you to learn. If, if we want a Christmas filled with the important things, then we have to simply open our eyes and look for the important things. That's repentance. If we want to be less busy, then we have to stop doing something. If we dream of peace on earth, goodwill to all, including us, then we have to repent of our need to do everything, buy everything, and keep everybody happy. If we're lonely, we need to reach out. If we're overwhelmed, we need to reach in. Some assembly is required. So, and don't worry, I'm, I'm getting to the end here. 
as I was pondering um, this sermon during my devotional time and trying to think, how do you wrap all this up? I came across a nursery rhyme. It was actually in the devotional. And I think it captures the spirit of Advent probably better than anything else. It, it, uh, it goes like this. A wise old owl lived in an oak. The more he saw, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he saw. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't we all be like that bird? I invite you today into the spiritual practice of repentance, John the Baptist style. Let's be like that bird, watching, noticing, seeing today. Let's live between the steps today. There's still time for the assembly required to be ready for Christmas morning. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. <laughs> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It's truly right and our gracious joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord. For we know that in the time of John the Baptist, you were calling your people to repent. And we hear this message again, recognizing that all of us need to stop and listen to change our lives this Advent season. May this sermon inspire us. May this meal at our Lord's table nourish us for our own reassembly that you do for us, O Lord our God. Therefore, we praise you. Join our voices with the celestial choirs and all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. We are grateful for the coming of your son, Jesus, both the coming that we celebrate at Christmas and the coming that we anticipate his second coming. So we look to the sky praying, come, Lord Jesus. Yet we live here in the in-between time, O Lord. We pray for our community, for this church, for our city, for all in places of authority, we ask you to be with us. For church members who've been ill, for folks who are grieving, for folks who are celebrating with good news, for folks who are devastated by bad news, we pray for one another. We rely on one another. We're grateful for your gift to us, the church. As we gather as the church, we remember how over the centuries Christians have gathered around this meal. We are grateful, Lord God, that we gather and we ask you to set this meal apart from a common to a sacred use, that it may mean for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom you sent here to earth. Lord, bless us as we gather at this table and as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord took bread. He blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood. Do this for the forgiveness of your sins. St. Paul reminds us that every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Feed on them in your hearts with faith and thanksgiving. Our worshipers who are worshiping online may take their bread and juice. I invite you to come down and partake also.